welcome back to another episode of Revenue Optimization Radio. Hosted by Patrick Morrissey, Chief Marketing Officer at Altify. Revenue Optimization Radio is brought to you by Altify, the sales transformation company. We believe the only way to unlock sustained growth is to deliver predictable revenue. Delivering insights, thought leadership, and the best practice on how to improve sales velocity. From the one man, maybe the only man who knows how to do all of that, least uh, this morning, Patrick Morrissey. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Paul. Good morning. How are you? Okay. Well, today is a topic that I find most intriguing. Women in revenue. You know, I had to look, read that twice. There don't seem to be a lot of women in the revenue generation field here. Is that uh, is that still the last old uh, old guys club here, or is it uh, breaking down? Uh, it's definitely breaking down, and anyone who thinks it's not breaking down is going to be on the wrong side of a, a sales or a revenue conversation because they will have gotten outsold by a woman. <laughs> and I'm I'm excited to dig into this topic because I think, uh, to your point, it's something that doesn't maybe get as much attention as it deserves. Everybody's trying to figure out, how do I optimize revenue? How do I drive more value for customers? And they spend a lot of money on tools and technology when what they maybe should be focusing on is hiring more women. That's really, the you know, I think one of the, the insights here. And I'm pleased to welcome Tracy Eiler into the conversation. And, and Tracy is uh, one of the foremost th- thought leaders on this topic. Uh, and when I say topic, I'm not just talking about, you know, women in revenue. I'm talking about what does good look like and great look like in, in B2B sales and revenue generation. She's one of the top 35 women in B2B sales. She's a CMO and executive at Inside View. She is also a board member and one of the founders of Women in Revenue. Tracy, good morning. Good morning, Pat, and thanks for the invitation. I'm I'm excited to get um, some background on you and and get your perspective on this because the topic of women in revenue seems to, to Paul's point, be something that seems to be a little bit overlooked. But we've recently done some research at Altify and just published our our benchmark, our customer revenue optimization benchmark, and one of the ahas out of the findings there was that if all else being equal, you can generate a 10% increase in win rate if the salesperson is a woman. And mm-hmm. it was a little bit astonishing to a lot of people the first time they get their, their eyes on that, but I don't think that's probably a surprise to you. Give me a little bit of your your background and, and what was the genesis of really um, women in revenue as an organization? Sure. Uh, you may not know this about me, Pat, despite the fact that we've worked together uh, a couple of times. My first job when I was 16 years old is I was a sales development rep at a software company. And um, we all had the generic name Chris Kelly because we were all high school kids and Chris never went away to college or got sick. You know, so there was always like this rotating group of Chris's. And in that experience, I really got the bug for sales and marketing and talking to prospects and seeing how sales organizations work and so on. And then went into marketing because I definitely do not have the, the fire in me for the rejection of sales. Um, but I love helping make sales successful. So that's kind of been my mantra is help make sales easier. The Women in Revenue group came together last fall where there was a group, um, kind of a loosely networked group of sales and marketing executive females that came together because we all saw this gap. We saw that our sisters in STEM jobs and math and engineering and science were starting to have special programs, um, even starting out, um, you know, in childhood, girls who code and things like that. But for um, women that are interested in jobs where they're driving revenue, um, marketing roles, sales roles, there just kind of wasn't anything. There were just loose networks. And so a woman named Sherry Johnson had the brainchild of let's put together this group called Women in Revenue. She got the all precious URL, womeninrevenue.org. The board Very came important. together with the mission of advancing the careers of women in revenue positions. And so we're doing that in two ways by providing networking opportunities and by providing mentorship. And one of the first things we did, of course, as you would, is figure out what's going on in the market. So we did a survey that we just released, and I think your um, listeners uh, will have access to the ebook that we just put out, which was our own findings plus a lot of third-party research. I'm dying to see yours. I downloaded it but haven't read it yet because that would be a great stat to add to the mix. There's been a lot of studies about this subject from McKinsey and Harvard and Bloomberg and others um, that I think really needs to be amplified in the market. 
Yeah, and, and I, re- I read the the ebook, and there's a mountain of great information that's also very, very well sourced here. Give me the give me the headlines and the the fifty thousand foot view for everybody that that really sets the the baseline in terms of you know current state of play of of um, women in revenue and and what's important. Well, you know, first we need to start with why companies should even care in the first place, right? Other than it's, you know, the right thing to do. Um, Bloomberg came up with a study that I thought was absolutely fascinating where um, they called it their gender equity index. And they basically tracked high performing stocks and saw if there was any difference between the gender mix in those companies. And not surprisingly, there was a big difference. The highest performing companies had the best gender mix. They also had programs that attracted working parents, as an example. Um, They also had mentorship programs, flexible healthcare, things of that nature. But the highest performing stocks were really the ones that did the best. And so that makes you think, okay, wait a second here, this is something companies should really pay attention to. In addition to it being the right thing to do, it's financially responsible. Um, And so then what we found out was things like um, from McKinsey and others that women actually make phenomenal revenue leaders. At the top of this hour, you were saying your own research said that um, you get 10% better growth or something if a a woman is at the helm. Was that how you said it? I can't remember the exact stat. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that women, the, our research uncovered that if um, you're looking to optimize and improve re- revenue performance, if you strip out other factors, there's a 10% difference in win rate if the seller and salesperson is a woman versus a man. Got it. It's a win rate thing. Okay, so what CEB found, which is now part of Gartner, and that's the old corporate executive board, what they found was that women in general had overall um, better effectiveness as sales leaders and marketing leaders by like a 10-point spread, um, which is pretty interesting. And the top attributes of those leading women were measured, and those included things that weren't, that were a little counterintuitive. And I'll explain what I mean. You would expect that female sales leaders, for instance, would be great at relationship building. You'd expect them to be great at inspiring and motivating other people, developing their team, having high integrity and honesty, Um, uh, making sure that people were working on self-development. You'd expect all those things to be true just based on what we know about women's tendency to be nurturing in the way they present to the world. But what they also found was that women ranked higher on driving for results and taking initiative, which was kind of shocking, honestly. When you looked at it, you think, wait a second, that would be what you'd think men would be great at, driver, driver, and then the women would be like more the account managers, right, nurturing and growing a book of business. Not so. And I, I, my hypothesis there, I, you know, I don't have an answer as to why exactly that is, but I think that, you know, women in the workplace, especially in high growing companies where they've got a big revenue number, they're pushing for results and they know how to get them. And they maybe the, the fact that women tend to have very good nurturing skills allows them to push their teams with a velvet glove, if you know what I mean, steel hand velvet glove. That's possible. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'd be interested in what your listeners think. Um, but, you know, that was, those were some of the attributes that, that we found, um, you know, in our own research. And, and it's interesting to ask women um, what it is that they need to be successful. And there's a whole body of research about that as well. Yeah, and, and it's inter- that's interesting, the, the counterintuitive nature of that. And it, it made me think, too, that or my observation in that, that dialogue, for what it's worth, is I find that um, more often than not, in, in part because of the social norm, that, that women have more responsibility for you know, kids in the household and men do, um, by and large, if I was to be overly general about it. And the reality uh-huh. is women just don't have time to waste because there's no way to manage the house or you know the the kids or yeah. school or schedules or everything else and spend a lot of time talking to somebody who's not going to buy from you. And so yeah. I find and, and, you know, uh, I the, think that's a great, the great point. women consistently, not only do they have some of the softer skills, but they are results oriented because they don't have time to mess around. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. In fact, there's a joke um, among some other single mom friends of mine 
that basically say, if you really want to get something done, give it to a single mom, um, cause they'll just be ruthless with their time. And, and I think that that's increasingly the case. I do think things are changing quite a bit also in, in families where both spouses, and in my case, currently now, my husband is a VP of sales, you know, I am taking on more responsibility in the home, but he's doing other things, right? So it's a, it's a wee bit more balanced, but it definitely is true that I have the lion's share of the responsibility of just making sure that like the college tours are booked and the appointments for the doctor are made and all of that kind of thing. And then that makes me really ruthless with my time management because it's the only thing that we can control is our time, honestly, right? A hundred percent. And that's that's the most valuable asset. And, and kind of you know, double clicking on that topic for a second, what do you find either in context of the, of the research or, the, or the, the networking with women in revenue or just your own observation that are some of the, the misconceptions about women as sales leaders? Yeah, I think that... Um I think that what I hear, so I'll tell you what I hear from my sisters first. I hear that women in sales, um, individual contributor sales roles, feel like it's a great career to make a lot of money, which is true, right? So if you are really trying to take off in your career, being a female seller allows you to differentiate yourself. There aren't that many of us and so on. But when it comes to making it into leadership, there really is kind of a boys club, Um and, you know, we work in tech, but I know it's true in other markets as well, um, where often to be a female executive in general, you are the one executive on the East staff or maybe the number two, the second executive on the East staff. And usually the first one is the VP of talent, not to generalize, but usually that's true, the HR person. Um, yep. And then, you know, if you're, if you're the second woman, um, it's just, it, it's just harder. You just don't think of it as a, a way to make it happen. I also think what, what is, is driving, um, blocking women from sales leadership roles is when you just think about the natural course of your career. And if you are a person, a female who wants to have family, a quarterly cadence and having a, a young baby doesn't really make sense, right? It's very, very hard to juggle. It's hard enough to juggle when you have a quote regular job like mine, um, where you can take a three month mat leave and your team will, you know, um, back you up. But if you're going to step out for a whole quarter or more, um, you know, to have a newborn and all of that, it becomes even more complicated, which is why companies, if they want to attract and retain us, need to really be able to adapt with, you know, flex work hours, maybe even some job sharing. I'm not saying that a CRO can job share, right? That's a, 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 a sort of different story. But if you're a mid-level sales manager, you know, maybe there is a way that the team can come around and accommodate your absence to have your child and then come back after your maternity leave, that kind of thing. So companies need to get smart about that. Salesforce is doing a lot of that kind of thing. But even, you know, but even they are, um, uh, you know, uh, faced with the same challenges that you might expect. Well, 100%, because the, and particularly in the subscription world we live in, you have to be always on and every week and every month and every quarter matter. So there's a, there's a little bit of conflict there. And I guess I'm interested from, from your perspective as a, and from a leadership per perspective, as well as thinking more broadly is if companies are, yeah, it seems like there ought to be a higher priority in, in trying to source more female candidates and more female leaders. What's the, um, you know, what's it take to make that happen? And, and what should a company uh, and an, an executive team be strategizing to make their their organization, regardless of the category you're in, you know, really compelling as a place to work for women? Well, in our survey, um, what women said that mattered the most to them were three things. They were really concerned about work-life balance, which meant flexible work hours, option to work from home once in a while, that was really key. The second one was mentorship programs, pairing them up with a buddy that was like them. And by the way, the mentor doesn't have to be another female. The mentor can be somebody like you, Pat, right? We need our brothers as allies in this whole thing as well. And then the third thing was an equal seat at the table, which to the women we surveyed said that they wanted influence um, over the resource allocation that would be part of their remit, part of their job responsibilities. And they wanted to know that that would be the case. And so when they were looking at um, new opportunities in new companies, the women in our survey and in other material I looked at, um, you know, kind of had four buckets. There was the representation bucket, like, do I see women on the board? 
do I see women on the leadership page on the website? But more importantly, is the company forthcoming about their gender mix? So, so for example, at my company, Inside View, 50% of, of our director level and above positions are filled by women. Um, 40% of our STEM jobs are female. And I think what the last time I counted, I can't do this percentage in my head, but at our sales kickoff meeting, um, regional sales kickoff meeting that we did in Austin in January, there were 55 people in the room and 29 were female. Um, and I always do a gender count. It's just sort of a um, uh, reflex from when I was the only one for a long time. And I, I think that it's important for companies to be very open about what their gender mix is in, at different levels in the company, more than you can just see on a website, and then what they are trying to do to attract more women. Now, what attracts women besides representation is they want to know there's equal pay. Um, and I, we've all seen the stories about how um, women and men are paid differently. And in, in our own ebook, we show that in sales and in marketing, there is a pay gap. Um, and it's a little ridiculous, I think, on the sales side, especially where it's black and white, right? You make your quota or you don't. So why would women be paid less if you have the same quota? It doesn't make any sense. The third item was healthcare. So, you know, women really care about um, their own healthcare and the healthcare of their families. I'm not saying men don't also, but women have a keen eye to that, especially I think if they have children. And to your point, um, typically women are managing kind of the healthcare of the family and making sure everyone's getting into their appointments. And so they're really paying attention to that. And then the last one was really job satisfaction um, with things like having um, options for uh, wellness and flexibility and, and things of that nature. Um, it's, it's more holistic, I think, than we might have thought it would be. Absolutely. And I want to come back to a couple of those comments here in a second, but let's pause to pay the bills and then we'll pick the conversation back up. You're only successful as your customers, and that demands the need for an exceptional sales execution, revenue retention, and customer success. The challenge for most sales leaders and their teams, however, is that their sales process just doesn't match how their customers buy. Sustained growth isn't possible because the revenue team isn't aligned with customers and prospects. With Altify's sales transformation solutions, companies can deliver predictable revenue growth. Yes, we said predictable revenue growth. They can also acquire and retain customers, and they can collaborate across the revenue team to qualify and win new business while delivering value that unlocks cross-sell and upsell opportunities. Built natively on the Salesforce platform, Altify helps salespeople, managers, and executives achieve sustained revenue growth. They help accelerate sales performance for Autodesk, Comcast, GE, Honeywell, Salesforce, Tableau, and United Healthcare. They can do the same for you. Visit Altify.com, just like it sounds, A-L-T-I-F-Y, Altify.com. And with that, let's head back to Patrick and his guest. Thanks, Paul. We're talking today with Tracy Eiler, who is on the board of Women in Revenue. And Tracy was just sharing some of the insights from the research and the feedback about what's important in attracting and retaining women. And you talked about you know, representation and companies being able to uh, be public about um, what is the mix of uh, what's the gender mix in leadership roles in the company, not just the, the top of the company uh, who's on the website, but also, you know, director and above leadership positions. You were talking about pay and health care and job satisfaction. And what it leads me to, Tracy, is it if, uh, you know, I flip this around, you were mentioning mentors a second ago. What's the what's the question um, or what should women be on the look out for as they're evaluating, you know, revenue opportunities and they're you know, they're being recruited by a company? So let's talk about that mentor and, and, and then in particular how mentors compare to sponsors, Pat, because I think that would be really interesting. The, the yep. women sales leaders in particular that I know all talk about the fact that they had a mentor. Uh, my dad used to call it having a rabbi, not to get religious on it, um, but somebody who's looking out for you. And in the women sales leaders I know, 99% of the time those were men that helped them. Um, that saw their talent, that groomed them, that showed them the way, that did all the things that a great mentor is going to do for you. And so I think when women are interviewing for roles, they need to really talk to the company about, okay, what's your support system here? How do your CPs of sales all work together? Um, how do we collaborate with the heads of engineering and marketing? Um, is there alignment between those teams and so on? And who's going to help 
teach me to get better. So maybe I'm interviewing for, you know, Western Regional Vice President of the United States to run sales for a company, but I have an aspiration of being a CRO someday. How am I going to get there in the next three years? What are you going to do to help me? And, um, and I think it's important for women to challenge in the recruiting process, but I think companies need to be ready for it and proactive with it because the women that are in sales today are very successful and they're very sought after. So if you want to get one of them, you're going to have to pull them out of the company they're in um, and they're going to get pickier and pickier. So I think what the smart thing to do for companies today is to look at the, the women that are on your sales team today and maybe even on your sales development team, right? The SDR is coming right out of college and pull them up through the ranks just like you do the men, right? Pair them up together, give them a buddy that's going to help push them. And if we think about what, how to feed into the recruiting, I wanted to make a plug for um, a really great organization called Silicon Valley Academy, SV Academy, um, that just was founded in San Francisco about 18 months ago by a guy named Raheem Fazel. And his mission is to create SDR-ready candidates. And so he hires people hires people, trains people is the right way to say it, right out of college, gives them 300 hours of training on how to be an SDR. And I'm sure your listeners all have the same problem that I do, which is I can't hire SDRs fast enough. I can't keep them in the seat fast enough. And these are the roles that are qualifying leads, booking appointments for sales reps, outbound prospecting, and so on. And Raheem is a a phenomenal, has a phenomenal diversity vision, which, um, in his candidate pool, so every month he gets about 3,000 candidates and they pick 30 and they put them through the 300 hours of training. And when those people come out of the training, they are really SDR ready. They know how to use CRM. They have had call coaching and guidance and so on. 60% of his candidates are female. A big percent, like 70% are first generation college graduates. And then there's a phenomenal racial minority myth as well. So for anybody that's trying to do uh, get better diversity in their companies at all levels, not just female, check out SD Academy. Um, we've hired five SDRs in the last six months from that program, and they are better than anybody else that we've ever hired right out of college and then tried to teach ourselves. So you know that that's a, a trick for somebody to try to get started early um, by getting more women in on the ground, and then you mentor them as they come through. That's that is a great tip for everybody, and I am definitely going to look them up. And I want to I want to take you back both to the the research as well as one of the things I was struck by in reading the the ebook was you had asked the question, and and the question back to you is what advice would you give to your younger self um, if you had a do over and could could go back in time that might help you have been more effective more quickly as a as a leader in women from a the women's perspective trying to climb the revenue chain. Yeah, I'll answer that personally, and then I, I can tell you what the research showed because it, um, it matched. We, we asked all of the people we surveyed, what's your advice to your younger self? And it was just an open text field. So we got just great information that's all in the ebook. But for me, it is that I wish that I had learned to listen to my gut instinct earlier. I've always had a very strong gut instinct, but because I worked with a lot of men and men the, the men that I worked with tended to be very analytical, often engineers, often finance backed, or even sales leaders who are very revenue and math focused. If you have a gut feel about something and you're the only woman and you're surrounded by a bunch of analytical men, there's just no way you're going to convince them that your gut feel means something, right? So I would often logic my way out of speaking up about my gut feel. And wouldn't you know, dang it, I was almost always right. Like I'd have an instinct about, no, we shouldn't run XYZ marketing campaign, or no, we shouldn't go to Chicago, we should go to New York instead, or whatever the thing might be. It could be a tactical decision, it could be a very big decision about an ad campaign or something, you know, a lead process we were putting in place. And my my gut would be telling me, Tracy, listen, something's wrong, but I wouldn't really know what was wrong, if that makes sense. You know, often when you have a gut feel, you don't know why you have it. It takes a little while to percolate until you kind of come up with the facts as to why. And I, I, as I've gotten older in my career and I, and I have gotten more female allies around me, but also more sensitive men who are willing to listen, you know, I might have a gut feel about something and I'll just say, hey, folks, 
I don't know why I feel this way, but I think this is absolutely wrong. I don't have data yet to prove it. I'll come back to you in a couple of days. But right now, this is going to be a mistake. And I wish that I had listened to her, <laughs> you know, when my 20s and in my 30s, because I can point back to some bad mistakes I made because I didn't listen to that gut. Um, you know, so that's mine. Um, and you can tell I'm passionate about it because I can remember some of these mistakes and just thinking, man, I could have avoided that. And, and, and I didn't. Absolutely. No, I, I get it. We've all, we've all been there, but I think that that's, that's also something that, uh, um, I think you're, you're pointing to several things that, that start with confidence and, and belief in self. And I think that comes back to, to mentoring. So I know um, we, we are getting to close to the top of the hour. So I want to give you the, the last word here on, on two points. One is, who's the best you know, revenue leader you've ever worked with and what did you learn? And the second thing is, you mentioned mentoring around women in revenue. And if you know, people want to get involved and, and, and connect how do they, and, and become mentors, how do they do that? So I have worked with some phenomenal revenue leaders. It's really hard to to pick just one, but every one of them brought a level of intensity to the business that was just unmatched. Um, the intensity towards that North Star, towards that revenue goal, and they brought everyone along with them. And, you know, of course, there's lots of sales um, skills that go along with that, but that intensity is the thing that I think that great revenue leaders and only great revenue leaders can bring. When it comes to mentorship and women in revenue, um, womeninrevenue.org is the URL. Please have your guests go there, take a look. You can get information, a newsletter. We're hosting quarterly events. Our next one is on April 25th, and it's a roundtable talks um, on a variety of different topics. Um, our first event was all about how to get on a board if you're female. Um, and then we're putting together a mentorship program, which you can sign up to be a mentor or a mentee. Pat, you would be a phenomenal mentor. Um, we're trying to make it really lightweight, keep it virtual. And so let's pretend for a second that you are an expert in um, messaging and positioning, which I happen to know you are. You could sign up to be a mentor on that topic. And then women that were interested in learning more about that could sign up to talk to you for, you know, 10 people could sign up to talk to you for an hour and a half over a, a Zoom meeting um, and get advice. And so we're trying to keep it lightweight, rapid, outcome-based, um, and people can sign up today to be a mentor or a mentee. And we need our brothers in this. We can't do it alone. So call to arms for all of your listeners um, you know, to, to uh, think about this topic and get involved. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate the invitation. Count me in. And I, as I said, at both the research we've done and we continue to find, I continue to observe just in my own professional career that hey, women outperform men. So that's probably the big takeaway from today's show. I'd like to thank our guest, Tracy Eiler, who is on the board of Women in Revenue. You can find out more at womeninrevenue.org. Tracy, thanks so much. Have a fantastic day and you know, good luck and happy selling. Thank you. You've been listening to another episode of Revenue Optimization Radio, brought to you by Altify, right here on the Funnel Radio Network for at-work listeners like you. 